Hello, 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 and welcome to our review of ACLS drugs for cardiac arrest patients. Yes, this topic sounds very dry, very boring, so I use Russian accent through the whole podcast to add for flair. No, I wish that I could do that, but I don't have the linguistic ability, and you all would probably go crazy, so you get my regular voice. Yes, this topic may be a little bit more dry, but it's pretty important. If you think about it, we do a lot of crazy things to some pretty dead people, and not many ER physicians out there, I bet, can speak intelligently about the data or evidence or lack thereof um, supporting some of the things that we do in cardiac arrest. So we're going to go over it. We are going to review some of the dogma today. We're going to talk about the evidence or lack thereof behind that dogma and hopefully get down to some of the bottom line. So let's begin. All right, so let's start with the main drug, the big guy, the drug that is used in almost every cardiac arrest patient, and that is epinephrine. So the big question here is, does this bad boy work? And if you have been listening to any of the podcasts out there recently, looking at some of the more recent-ish data, um, there's a lot of talk about it. A lot of talk about, is this an effective drug? And the answer to the does this bad boy work question is, it depends on what outcome you're measuring. So let's talk about some of the data. One of the major articles that is discussed, that is the Jacobs article in resuscitation in 2011, short word PACA, uh, or PACA trial, I believe. And they compared epinephrine to placebo um, in about 500 patients, 250 per side. And this is a randomized double-blind placebo control trial. That's probably why it gets a lot of press. It is the gold standard in terms of our evidence-based medicine. So what did they find? Here's a breakdown of their data. They assessed both ROSC and survival to discharge uh, in their patients. And in that first outcome, uh, return to spontaneous circulation, pretty significant difference, about 24% versus 8.5. This was statistically significant. More patients got ROSC with epi than without. But if you follow these people through, watch them over time, what happens to them? So their survival to discharge, who's walkie-talkie, who can get out of the hospital? 4% versus 2% epi versus placebo. And this was not statistically significantly different. Again, 250 patients per side, not the biggest trial out there, but randomized double-blind placebo control with no statistically significant patient-centered outcome. Pretty important study. What else is there? So there's the Hagahara trial that was in JAMA 2012. This study was a little bit different because it recruited, recruited a buttload of patients. The, it was a study in Japan from 2005 to 2008. There were 15,000 in the epi group and 400,000 in the non-epi group. It was a prospective non-randomized observational propensity study, and that's why they were able to get their numbers so high. But uh, what did they see? What were their findings? So this study, they looked at similar outcomes. They looked at ROSC, and they looked at survivability. And they saw similar trends. With epinephrine, the rate of ROSC was significantly higher, 18.5% versus 5.5%. But again, if you follow these patients out over time, what happens to them? So one month survivability, 5.4 versus 4.7%. Not a really big difference, and certainly not a statistically significant difference, even with these large number of patients. What percent of them had a good outcome, a good neurologic or a good overall outcome? 1.4 versus 2.2. No difference here. So in patient-centered outcomes, a large study, not randomized, but a large observational study, there was no difference in the patient-centered outcome of who gets out of here, walk and talk in. All right, let's look at another one the Nakahara study. This was in Academic Emergency Medicine in 2012. It was a retrospective study in Japan again. Um, there are about 50,000 patients in this. It was a little bit different of an approach because they excluded all patients who got ROSC before epinephrine administration. They talk about that decreasing selection bias. I'm not a statistician. That doesn't quite make a whole lot of sense for me in terms of assessing the efficacy of epinephrine but that's one of their citations. What did they find? So they saw that after crunching some numbers, the early administration, meaning less than 10 minutes, administration of epinephrine after cardiac arrest had increased 
intact neurologic survival with an odds ratio of basically 1.4 and increased overall survival. And at the end, they quote, early epinephrine administration may, may be associated with higher rates of intact neurologic survival, as long as you can get it on board 10 minutes after the arrest. Good luck with that. So we include this trial because it is a somewhat positive study, I guess you could say, uh, is the other side of the coin in terms of the epinephrine stuff. But the other two studies are the major ones out there that are cited. There are multiple other negative studies, but those are the highest quality in terms of either being randomized or having a large number of patients. Um, and again, no major patient-centered outcome in comparing epinephrine to not epinephrine. All right, so let's move on. Next class, the antiarrhythmics. And if you take a second look at your ACLS card in your mind, you realize that they're really only talking about one agent here, one big player, and that is amiodarone. So what does ACLS say about amio? They say it is the first line antiarrhythmic agent for cardiac arrest because it has been clinically demonstrated to improve the rate of ROSC and hospital admission and refactory VF or pulseless VTAC. If you take that sentence, swallow it, digest it, spit it back out, what are they really talking about? They're looking at surrogate markers here, right? ROSC and hospital admission. These are not patient center outcomes. These are other markers for the drug. And they recommend it on these basis. Let's talk about their data. Let's go over what they cite for these recommendations. So the first article they reference is an article by Kandunchuk, I believe is the pronunciation, a New England Journal article in 1999 that I looked at AMIO. It was an interesting study. It was a randomized double-blind placebo control comparing AMIO to saline. But what were their basis? This is worth mentioning. So they looked at patients who had not been resuscitated after getting three or more rounds of shocks. From there, they were randomized to either get AMIO at 300 milligrams or placebo. And again, about 250 patients per side. What did they see? So amyl being the light gray, placebo being black, there was an increased level of ROSC for these patients. Definitely a difference there. So in total, though, looking at people down the line, of the 504 total patients that were seen, about 13% survived. Of the 130 that were admitted that didn't make it out, only 13 patients woke up and 117, 90%, never regained consciousness. And what they say, to quote it exactly so you know what we're talking about, proportion of patients who survived a discharge did not was not statistically significant, did not differ significantly between amio and placebo. All right, let's talk about another one that ACLS cites. This is the Duran study in the New England Journal in 2002. This was a bit different. It compared amiodarone to lidocaine, so two different antiarrhythmics, but still cited as an evidence for amio. Um, they found that about 22-23% of the patients in the amio group survived to admission compared to 12% in the lidocaine, supporting amio as a better agent as an antiarrhythmic. But in looking at things down the road, um, there was a 5% hospital discharge rate for the amio group versus a 3% discharge rate for lidocaine with a p-value of 0.34. So no statistically significant difference in the two in making people, you know, walkie-talkie, living on to live a life uh, after the hospital. So what else do they cite in the ACLS literature for the support of amio? There's a little bit of a rug sweeping here where they just kind of say a couple other studies, citing about four of them, document consistent improvement in getting rid of the arrhythmia in patients and also animals with VFib or unstable VTAC. So just quickly perusing these four sites or citations that they use, taking a look. The first one that they mention is this guy. I won't even pretend to pronounce that name. It was in some Scandinavian journal in 2004, titled The, Un the Use of Undiluted Amio in the Management of Out-of-Hospital Cardiac Arrest. Really, if you break that article down, they were looking at the hemodynamic effects of using amiodarone, um, specifically its effect on blood pressure. They made absolutely no conclusions about ROSC or neuro outcomes. But again, it is used uh, by ACLS to support the use of amiodarone. So just a little bit of the flavor for how things, um, the level of evidence 
uh, to support amyo in these patients. And if you wanted to break the numbers down, no statistically significant or no major difference between the two group in getting um, ROSC. All right. So moving on, next medication. What do you think it is? Cocaine, maybe? No. What's that? Little biochem. This is bicarb. Let's talk a little bit about bicarb. So in a cardiac arrest patient, we use bicarb for this theory. We think that the acidosis of porphyrfusion affects cellular protein function, and by reversing some of that acidosis, we can help our patient's cells do better. In reality, we see a lot of mixed reviews when we look at the literature. Let's talk a little bit about what's out there on that stuff. So we're going to break it down into some positive and negatives and just do some quick hits for this. So the Bar-Joseph study that is cited in ACLS for bicarb, it was done in 2005, another Scandinavian article. It was really just a data set review. There are 2,000 patients, um, and it was a very strange um, methodology. They broke hospitals down as to low sodium bicarb users versus high sodium bicarb users and compared outcomes in patients and found that the hospitals that use sodium bicarb more had better outcomes for their patients, and therefore they concluded that use of sodium bicarb helps patients do better. Obviously flawed, there's no specific uh, causation there. I mean, hospitals that use sodium bicarb may use many other things that are actually the cause of better patient outcomes. Next study, Weaver circulation in 1990. They looked at Lido and Epi patients. There were 200 of them. Um, it's actually really just that assessment. They were primarily looking at the use of epinephrine and lidocaine in their patients, and they found that resuscitation um, but not survival rates were higher during the period of time in which sodium bicarb was used. It was breaking down time frames from years prior to a two-year period before to a two-year period after and found that the time where sodium bicarb was used, patients did better. Again, very hard to create a causal relationship there. Next study, let's look at some of the negative studies by these people in resuscitation in 1995. So this was a prospective randomized double-blind control trial where they used a buffer solution, sodium bicarb, and looked at outcomes. And what did they see? Here's their numbers. Just a quick breakdown. The number of patients that were admitted that got ROSC and were admitted to the hospital was basically the same. The number of patients that were discharged alive were basically the same. And there's no statistically significant difference between the two. Negative study. And the other one that is cited as a negative study in ACLS is the Vickmer uh, study in 2006. This was a random double-blind control trial, and overall they found no benefit at all for sodium bicarb, and they actually saw an increased mortality um, in some of the patients. That resolved if they uh, controlled for weight and things like that, but in comparing patients that got sodium bicarb that, to those that did not, there was no statistically significant difference in outcome. When they did crunch their numbers in this study, they found that the subgroup that got bicarb and had a long arrest time, which was quoted as being greater than 15 minutes, if you were down for 15 minutes or more and got bicarb, they actually saw a trend towards increased survival. And so this is, again, a, a bit of literature that is used to sort of support the buffering theory of a, someone that has higher acidosis, bicarb may increase your survivability. So that's where that comes from. So that's it. Those are some of the major articles out there uh, discussing the utilization of the three major meds that we want to talk about that we often use in cardiac arrest patients. Take some of this information think it over, digest it before you code your next patient. Thanks for listening.